All right, let's go get started. So I'm Dave Kennedy. Um, I'm a chief security officer at a Fortune 1000 company. I wrote the Social Engineer Toolkit, Fast Track, and a new tool called Artillery. Um, this thing's supposed to work. There we go. There it is. And I'm on the Backtrack development team, uh, the Exploit DB development team, and basically I'm a penetration tester, exploit writer, and a bunch of bunch of other things. And so. When I came up with this talk, I, want, I, I was looking at where we're at in security and a lot of things that I see in the industry. And the penetration testing execution standard, if you sat in that talk, was a lot about it. But I get to see a lot of unique things in my position and a lot of unique things when I do assessments for other companies. And so I'll pose a question to everybody in the audience here. Who here feels that they can withstand a targeted attack against their company? So yeah, that's, that's generally the reaction I get. So not a lot of people. And so why is that? Why can't we withstand a targeted attack as an infrastructure, as, a, as an actual industry? And so the first thing is we aren't secure, right? We aren't able to protect against attacks. We're scared of guys like this running around. And where were we during all of that, right? And we sat there in the sand hoping that we weren't going to be the next ones to be attacked because we knew that our security wasn't any better whatsoever. And so instead of being united in a front of security, we prayed, please don't let us be the next ones to get breached or hacked. And I don't know if you noticed the security community during the time of, of LawSec or Anonymous, but everybody was silent. No one said anything negative about, about them. No one went and spoke against them. It was really just everybody's like, I don't want to touch that because I don't want to be hacked, right? And so we watched and we waited. And we saw different companies get breached, right? We saw more and more and more, which ironically was with blind SQL injection, um, and more and more and more. And so we had a lot this year, right? <laughs> So we had a lot of breaches this year. We had a significant number. And so we're scared, and so we hire consultants. My clicker doesn't work really well. So we hire some consultants, right, to fix our challenges in industry. And we get these certifications to give us more knowledge, to expand our knowledge. And we invest in compliance to protect us, to secure our organization, right? And we, are, we prioritize what we're doing so that we can incorporate risk management. We create complexity with risk formulas. And we spend, right? That's kind of the industry right now. So why do we suck? Well, in order to answer that question, and I'll answer that question, and I'll give you the answer how to fix it, we really need to understand the past, present, and future of where we came from and, and security. And so security kind of started off a little bit like this, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so formerly. And so before we had hackers, we had, you know, the, the actual security community, we had hackers come out and do different types of things, which kind of spawned the industry as we know it today. You know, started off with hackers and having to protect against hackers, and so we came out with it. And so technology progressed. So did hackers. And a new era was born, the security industry. And so if you flash forward to today, this is what I view today as, right? It's a complete train wreck. If you look at statistics from 2009 to 2010, if you look at the industry as a whole, security conferences recorded a record number of attendees. You guys here is a prime example of it. You guys weren't here 10 years ago, at least some of you might. I mean, the guys with the ponytails still were, but um, I wasn't here. And if you look at how the industry started to... to grow and grow and grow, we had a record number of attendees. Security staff decreased during the recession, at least in the United States, and went up. Windows spent an estimated $1 billion just on security between Windows Vista and 7, which, OK. Um, and in 2008, if you start looking at how we're doing from a breach statistic perspective, there's this great site out there called privacyrights.org. And in 2008, there was 354 reported public data breaches. RBS WorldPay was one of them, which was a bazillion amount of social security numbers. In 2009, there was only 252. So we got better, right? Well, unfortunately, they were literally the largest breaches we've ever seen in the history of like breaches ever. 
We had the largest amount of PCI data, PHI, PAI, everything else. It just, we just got destroyed that year. And so you look at 2010, we spent over 34% more on security from 2009 to 2010. 34% more as an industry. In 2010, there was a 594 report of public data breaches, over double of that of last year. And so if you look at breach statistics, that's kind of how it looks, right, with pretty graphs. If you look at security spend, it's kind of how it looks, right? And so we buy products to protect us. We are the only industry that I know of that can keep increasing our expenditure, expenditures and continue to get worse. We're the second industry, sorry, the weathermen are the first. But and so they're bad. I mean, it, I, I was told it wasn't going to rain my entire way here, and uh, it was one of the most bumpiest flights I've ever had in my life. But if you buy these products, right, they're going to fix it. If you buy intrusion prevention, if you buy clicker, host based intrusion prevention, web application firewalls, file integrity mining, firewalls, antivirus, whitelisting, blacklisting, patching solutions, vulnerability scanners, network access control, an app preventer, data loss prevention, anomaly detection, heuristics, shiny stuff, right? This is what we're told to buy to fix the crap that we have right now in security. And all of those have failed us because they don't work. Does anybody here have DLP implemented? We have one. Does anybody here have it working? Is anybody doing anything other than looking for social security numbers and credit cards? Okay, just checking. Has anybody stopped apt? Do we even know if anybody's really had apt or what that really is? Is that kind of like a thing like the cloud where the first 15 minutes you explain what the cloud is? So, we have consultants, right? And consultants are designed to come in and fix our problems because they know it better than us. So we hire these guys to come in and do our security assessments and our penetration tests and our risk assessments. And, you know, I, not to pick on the big five because we're, they're all guilty of it, but they come in and they give you this, this model of how you need to architect your enterprise security um, program. And it's this five-year plan about how you spend a million this year, maybe three million next year, and then it's going to decrease after year after year, right? And I have not seen a company fully implement that. Has anybody implemented a five-year plan of security before that actually works? Okay, good. We're on the same page. At least I'm not unique. So somehow they know the business better than we do inside of our own company. And so again, we spend and spend and spend and spend because that's what we're told is going to fix our problem. If we keep throwing money at it, we're going to be good, right? This stuff doesn't stop us. It doesn't. It barely stops her. That's where we're at right now. It barely stops her. And she's a mean hacker. So why? If you look at how we're balanced right now, there's, a, there's an influx of crap that's going on between compliance veterans and products versus actual real security and fixing things. You know, we have all these terms like GRC and risk deferment and risk management programs and, and all these things that are supposed to, to build our programs up and mature it, and I haven't seen one that's been decently mature. And you guys proved it th today. When I asked you how many of you can stop a targeted attack, the answer was no. And I haven't run into an audience that would raise their hand to that. We're not very secure in our, in, our, uh, in our clothes right now. And so you have this big influx of compliance and risk management, and really where security is this tiny little thing. We're not actually securing organizations. But people will say we're in tune with the business, right? Has anybody heard that before? We know the business. We need to know the business, what the business says. You know, it's this like hypothetical monster that no one ever knows or no one can know in security. And so that brings me to my next point, which is a very favorite topic of mine, which is the CISO and CSO. For that, I mean, for, for CISOs and CSOs today, they're purely focused on business. Let me ask a question. Does anybody here have a technical CSO in place? Couple, two, that's great. It's gonna be the, the wave of the future, trust me. Think about this, you have business guys running your security program, right? That would be like me saying, hey, le the head of legal, you don't need any law experience whatsoever to run the legal shop. You can just talk all businessy and win court cases. Or, hey, head of HR, you probably don't need any HR experience. Or, hey, a general, you know, you, you didn't need to be a troop. 
You don't need to know how to fire a gun. You don't need to, to do any of that stuff because, you know, you can just figure it out and talk all businessy. And so the CSOs and CISOs today are business folks, not security folks. They do not know how to secure an organization. Now, again, I'll explain how this works in a second. But they buy and 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 they wonder why they have a breach. They do not fix things. They buy things. They sell risk management programs and GRC and DLP and, and APT. You know, all of these different buzz terms, whatever happens to be going on at the, the RSA conference that everybody else is selling that, that year is the terms that we use in order to build our programs up. And so what I'll say about tech, uh, business savvy CISOs and CSOs is we've needed them for a while because we have no idea how to talk. As security people, we've never known how to communicate to the organization and actually explain what we're doing. What I can tell you is we don't need them anymore. What I'll say is you are the next CSO. Mark my words. You have to be the next CSO. If you aren't, we're screwed, seriously. And think about it. I mean, where are we at right now in security? I mean, we're a very immature industry, 10 years. We needed the business folks to help us out and actually establish some sort of security. Now we can blow everything that they did up and start from scratch and actually do it right. And why I say that is, and I'll, and I'll explain this, but if you look at the business and how businesses make decisions, the businesses make decisions on what they know. Us as hackers have a very tough time communicating any type of information about security to where they feel comfortable of what they know. And that's where the business guys kind of came in and they threw in all of these different formulas and risk equations and uh, GRC and all these other things to hopefully change that for them, right? When they weren't even making decisions on security anymore at that point. Risk deferment? <sighs> Seriously? I'm gonna transfer the risk to the business? Really? Is that gonna secure organization in any way, shape, or form? All we need to do is communicate. I'll tell you, right now, the easiest thing is th th the, the word the business is just communication, talking in a language that they can understand. That's about it. And so you might be saying, hey, how am I qualified to say this? So here's how you guys know me, right? The social engineer toolkit, or the Tenzi device, or the Tenzi++ customized, you know, or um, some code that I wrote, or me giving hugs to people, or you know, me talking in front of people. So I'm a hacker, right? Sure. What you don't see is that's me in a suit, or doing stuff like meeting in business, you know, meet, uh, actually holding meetings and having meetings within the organization. I meet with our, CEO, uh, our CFO every single week. I meet with our CEO on a monthly basis. I report to the board. Or sitting in like really important meetings where you actually make decisions and stuff. I'm a CSO of a Fortune 1000 company. I have budget with capital expenditures and expenses. I meet with the CFO. I give presentations to the board. Again, Eric and I talked about that. We actually have a working security program. I can say that. I, we, actually, we actually fix things in the organization. It's not perfect, but we actually tackle issues that are important to the organization. We don't have this risk acceptance model. We don't have convoluted risk management processes. We are viewed as a business enhancement in the company. The company actually looks at us as like, wow, these guys are awesome. We need to incorporate them into what we're doing or else we're screwed. We don't buy billions of dollars of products. We don't need them. We rely on people. We rely on the people in the business to help us. We, our, our motto in, in, our, in our company is uh, security is a, a, an individual effort but a team responsibility. And it's true. It holds true within our entire company. We have funding. We have funding. If I ask for it, I get it. Anybody else have that? Kind of? Someone's kind of, yeah. <laughs> so who here has a great budget and staff? Got one? Amen, man. There's not many of us. So for those of you that don't have a great budget and staff and want to be the next CSOs or anything like that, I can kind of help you with that. And let's talk about the topic of breaches. We are terrified of a breach in security, right? We look at breaches as the most horrendous thing that can happen. What I'll tell you is breaches can actually be a good thing for you. It almost takes a breach in a company for something to actually move, to actually inject security into the culture. 
most people could care less about security within the company. It, takes, it actually takes a culture change for something like that to work. And so come to the realization in your security program, no matter how good you are, that you will never be 100% secure, period. In most cases, a breach will not destroy your company. There's been two that had breaches that went down in, in under Digi Diginor and uh, like one in like 2006. Those are the only two companies that have ever filed for bankruptcy specifically because of a breach. So in most cases, nine out of, nine out of 10, you're not gonna be breached. You know, TJ Maxx is reporting record number of, of profits right now. If you look at their, their stock options, it's like dip, whoosh, right back up. Recovered easy. So sometimes uh, what I'll, I'll say to you is sometimes a breach isn't as bad as it sounds. It can help us. So, you guys can't get security budget? Experience a breach. I'm serious on that. And so there's really two options in experiencing a breach. Option one is you get popped. Yeah, it sucks. You can't really control it. But use that opportunity to change the culture in the company. Use that opportunity to make sure the business understands how bad it hurts when these type of things happen. Because it's going to be inevitable. You're never going to be 100% secure all the time. And 99.9%, .9 you've already experienced a breach. You just don't know it yet. So experience that. And use that for your benefit. Don't be scared. Don't be like, man, I'm so sorry I couldn't protect the organization. Listen, dude, I've been telling you for three effing years to do this. And this is what happens when you don't. Use it. Option two, which is probably the most preferable, is simulate a breach. So instead of actually experiencing a bad one, you can also simulate for, through penetration testing. And so who here has had a penetration test done before? Okay. I'll ask that question again in about three minutes. A penetration test today, and you heard a little about, about this in, in P-Test, is not what it was designed to be. Today's penetration test is essentially a vulnerability scan with validation and testing on top of it, which means that they run scanners to deploy to look at any type of uh, patch that you might have out of date or a misconfiguration or something that they've developed in their scanners to detect a possible exposure. And then from there, the penetration tester will go in and exploit that specific vulnerability that, that scanner found. How is that a simulated breach? It's not. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Participation. A penetration test has always been designed, and it should have been always designed, to simulate an actual attacker, to simulate a breach. And the only thing that your company cares about, period, is its ability to generate revenue. And so penetration tests should mimic that. How can I actually attack an organization, exploit them, and hurt them so that they can no longer generate revenue? Or I impact the revenue so much that it just really jacks up their company. That's what a pen test is designed to do. They are designed to simulate a breach, period. Penetration test equals breach simulation. That's it. Simulate a breach. You need to jack a company up. Bad. Just make them hurt. You need to make them hurt. You should be able to, sh be able to show how you can actually destroy that company. And, and Chris Nickerson, if he's in here, I don't know if he is or not. Um, he, he's back there. Love you, baby. Um, he used the... the, the the rationality of, you know, break into GM, and it was, it was a better explanation than I could ever give, but, you know, break into GM and you hack into their manufacturing plant, and you, instead of them making GM products, they start making Ford products. So, I mean, that will jack their company up beyond any type of, you know, comparison you ever can. If they start trying to sell Ford products from a, from a GM-made uh, manufacturing plant, but there's millions of different types of examples that you can do. At my company, you know, future projections, um, schematics of our, our product lines, uh, things like that, are, and we're a big services company. So if you target any three of those different types of, of avenues, you're going to make us hurt. And that's what we do. We target those business units to make them show pain. So again, who here has had a penetration test done before? The hands went down quite a bit. And so let's look at hacking today. If you look at the evolution of hacking, we, we somewhat started off with social engineering. And we kind of went to the network layer. Then we went to operating systems. And then we went to web applications. And then we started with client side, which Adobe is still getting hit. And then um, from there, you know, who knows if it's going to be cloud computing or whatever. But it's kind of back at the, the social engineering um, part right now. And I wanted to touch briefly on the cloud. 
And every time, every time I see it, I have to drink. So that's one right now. That's two. So the cloud for me is like taking a big chance. And it's like going out there and throwing your data somewhere where you have no idea the type of controls that are on it. And you just basically are taking live data and moving out there. And this is uh, terms and services uh, taken from a cloud service provider. And, and why I think this is important is because this is pretty much identical in every shape or in form to any type of cloud service provider that you, provide, that you go with. And so <laughs> let me just read the, the, um, the red parts here. That the service is free of viruses or other harmful components. Any content downloaded or otherwise obtained through the use of this service downloaded is at your own risk will be solely responsible for any damages to your computer system and loss of data that result from such download. Um, there's also a part of it here that I like is uh, um, uninterrupted or secure, that any defects or errors will be, be corrected. I mean, it just, it basically dissolves the company of any type of legal liability whatsoever for putting your information up in, this inform in these clouds. And this is where we're putting all of our data at. I feel like we've gone back about 10 years in security with the cloud. So what now? If you look at the future of security, we have a long ways to go when it comes to actually protecting ourselves against attacks, against targeted attacks. We're not anywhere near to be able to handle even the most simplistic. I mean, SQL injection is 13 years old. It's a teenager. And yet, if you go to any OWASP meeting or you go to any web application security one, the first thing they're going to talk to you about is SQL injection. 13 years old. Buffer overflows are before I was even born. I mean, we're still having those. So we have a long ways to go when it comes to actually secure organizations, and it's going to take a real big fundamental shift in how we're doing it. And it's going to take technical people like us to run it. And in my opinion, there's, there's two real types of, of CISOs or CSOs. You could have one that's business-centric or, or focused that can actually communicate, but he understands the technical abilities of the people to actually secure the organization. And so his only purpose is to be the chief sales officer. All that guy does is whore himself out to the executives to get more funding. And he lets the technical people build the program to do what they need to do in order to secure their organization. The second is the hybrid, which is us. The guys that are technical, that understand and that grew through the ropes of security, that can actually start to secure organizations, but can also communicate at the same time. I hate to tell you guys, but you're going to have to start talking to people and talking their language. A CFO or a CEO doesn't care about security. All they care about is their risk towards the company. If you can show an inherent risk to the company, they will, in 99.9% .9 of the time, fix it because they don't want to go down and burn either. So it's all about communication. So the future, that's really up to us. It could be this. This clicker sucks. It could be this. Or you could step up and be the next CSO. The thing that we need to do is we need to invest in our people and do some hard work because technology is not going to do it for us. Your magic product that is that box that's shiny in the closet that is your app preventer or your DLP preventer or whatever it is that you're buying is not going to fix your problems. Listen, I'm not saying that you don't need to buy technology sometimes. I mean, there's some really good technology out there like a SIM that can actually correlate centrally of what you do, but what you build on top of that is where you start to get in the meat and potatoes of things. Technology should be used as an enhancement to a, an actual program that's mature that you already have in there. You're going to automate some function of that portion of something that makes it even better. In most cases, we slap a product in and, that, and that's our program, right? Or if we can just impact change, secure critical assets to the company, remove any type of complexities that you have out there, throw away your risk formulas. Those are bullshit. They're bullshit. Risk formulas are absolutely bullshit. They do nothing to your company about when an attacker at 3 o'clock in the morning is going to come and hack you. Ignore the fear mongering, which I'm not doing, by the way. I'm not fear mongering or anything. I'm just saying. Throw away your five year plans that you have for security and just secure your stuff. That's it. The easiest thing to remember for me is, is find out what your company does to make money and just protect that. That's it. That's all you gotta do. It's like it's like I could I could have made like five hundred thousand dollars from a big five just telling you that right there, because that's all they're doing. Invest in people, guys, and to end technology, and just get back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's every day of my life. And so that concludes my high-level stuff because as a CSO, I'm not a, just a CSO, I'm a technical person, so I always gotta show you guys breaking into shit, so. Um, so what I wanna show you is a tool that I wrote, which is a new version out right now, actually, called, this little thing called the Social Engineer Toolkit. And actually, I need to find my, my little Tenzi device here real quick. But has anybody here used the Social Engineer Toolkit before in the past? Hey, that's good to hear. Is anybody not familiar with it? Raise your hand, please, I do wanna know. Has anybody not heard of the Social Engineer Toolkit? Great, okay, good. So the Social Engineer Toolkit for me is probably the easiest way to break into an infrastructure or an organization. And why is that? Because humans are the weakest link when it comes to penetration testing right now. Why fight a million dollars in security that you've invested in your SIMs, your IPS, your IDS, your NIPS, your whatever the heck, app preventer, wallsec preventer, all the stuff that you guys bought, when I can just call somebody up, impersonate them, impersonate somebody in the company, and have them click on whatever I want to. And so I wrote this about two and a half years ago or so, and it really has become a standard in penetration testing as far as social engineering goes. If you guys aren't doing social engineering as part of your penetration testing, you're really missing out. You're really missing a large avenue of exposure that probably is one of the most significant threats that you have to face today. I mean, I don't really even go for like SQL injection or anything like that anymore. I, and think about it, like I, I've written zero days before, like IE zero days and some other stuff, and I got one on my computer right now that I'm working on actually. But um, you know, it'll take me about two weeks or so of, of heavy fuzzing and reversing and crafting an exploit up and bypassing the Windows protection mechanisms of like DEP and ASLR and whatever I need to do in order to write that exploit, right? It's two weeks of frustration. Exploit writing is frustration for me. It's a pain in the butt. And so two weeks of doing this to an environment that I hope the other company has or that maybe I did some profiling and maybe a certain subset of the company has and the hope that that goes off and they don't have any other type of protection mechanisms in place sucks. You know how long it takes to compromise an organization with social engineering? A day. And that's just me doing my you know, diligence of trying to understand the organization, how they make money. I develop my pretext and who I'm going to assume um, for a social engineer. So generally, a lot of times, like LinkedIn is our favorite one for every, like everybody uses it. And so like, I'll look at like the help desk, for example, because they're generally a rotating door within a company. They don't usually like to stay in the help desk for a long period of time because people hate dealing with customers and, and irate you know, people within the company. And so <laughs> you have new people coming in and out of the help desk. And so what I'll do is I'll go on LinkedIn, I'll look for the specific company name, and I'll just look at all the new employees. And I generally look for people that have elevated privileges within the company, and I'll specifically target them. And so I'll call them up, I'll spoof my, my phone number to appear like I'm coming from inside of the company, and I'll be like, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a VP of sales, I'm really trying to get this website to work, I have a $2 million you know, proposal online. I really need your help here. You know, can you help me? And you know, there's a common technique within social engineers called anchoring, which is probably like one of the easiest ones to understand and do. But you know, if I call up somebody and I say, hey, I'm vice president of sales. I'm so-and-so. I have a really big problem. I just planted an anchor in that dude's head of, hey, this guy's, for one, he's of importance. But two, this guy is in need of help. I haven't asked them yet for anything like that. But as soon as I do, he's going to do it. And I pull my anchor and he's gonna help you out no matter what. And it's very hard to protect against these different types of attacks. And so with SET, it couples technology with the process of social engineering. And so what I'll say back to you is, exploits are great. They're fun, they're sexy, they're awesome, right? But when you're targeting a company, do you know if they have IE6 or IE7 or IE8 or Windows 7 64-bit or Windows 7 32-bit or Windows XP or Windows Vista? All these different variations that can cause the exploit not, not to work because there's rarely universal exploits that work across the board because they're very specific to memory address spaces within those individual operating systems and even service packs. So why target those with exploits anymore? I don't use them. I don't use exploits anymore. I haven't used an exploit in a penetration test when I was doing social engineering in the longest time. And reason being is it's so easy to use things that aren't exploits that are legitimate in nature to do it. And so here's set command line. There's also a, a web GUI interface into it. And also, for those of you that, that used uh, Fast Track in the past, I, um, I ported Fast Track over into the in set in this last release. So it has all the attack vectors within set. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the social engineer attack. Can everybody see it okay? Okay. 
And there's a bunch of different types of attack vectors in here. There's the Adreno-based attack vectors, website attack vectors, spear phishing, wireless access point attack vectors, SMS spoofing. Um, it's got a lot of different types of attack vectors in it. My favorite one, by default, is the website attack vector. And what the website attack vector does, and, and I'm going to use my favorite portion of it, but you have a credential harvester, which credential harvester, you can go out and clone any website you want to. It'll automatically rewrite the post parameters for you and then redirect them back to your site first and then redirect them back to the legitimate site so they never knew that they were there. So you can steal uh, credentials. But my favorite one is this Java applet attack <coughs> because everybody has Java installed. And a Java applet isn't an exploit. I can write whatever malicious Java applet that I want to and deploy it onto a victim machine. You have full access to that person's machine once they click run. And there's a lot of stuff that I've done in there that really pisses people off that they literally have to hit run or else they have to like task kill I, I Explorer or Mozilla or whatever because it doesn't let them. So let's go ahead and select that. And since I don't have internet access right now, I'll just use a, use a web template. But you could use the site cloner, which you can just clone any website you want to. It doesn't make a difference. And I'll go ahead and do web templates. And I'll just use Gmail as an example. Actually, I think I do have internet on right now. Let's see. Yeah, I do have internet, so I'm gonna do, I'll do the site cloner. One second here. All right, so I'm gonna go into website attacks, Java applet, site cloner, and I'll just clone Gmail, it doesn't matter. So it will automatically go out, grab Gmail, pull it back, rewrite everything that it possibly can, and then set you up a fake web server that everything's uh, working there. Now, <laughs> this is the cool part of the new, the new version. So I just released a new version of uh, set. It's version 2.2, and I have a bug fix. So I've been spending about two months trying to figure out this bug, and I happened to have an idea as I was writing the train system over coming to here, and I, I ended up fixing it. So I'm really happy about that. And what this new attack vector does, there's, there's, there's a bunch of different types of payloads. You can use... The one that I built for set, it's a completely um, custom uh, reverse shell, basically, but it has a lot of different features like bypass UAC, keystroke logging, um, SSH reverse tunneling, uh, you know, RDP, all those different types of things are already built into it. Raddy is one um, that Thomas Worth built. He's a developer on the, the, the toolkit. And this purely communicates over HTTP natively. So it's an HTTP-based protocol that communicates over TCP and HTTP-based protocol. So if you're doing HTTP inspection, it gets around that. Um, then you also have um, the ability to use any of the Metasploit payloads. Now, what's the problem with Metasploit payloads, especially if you guys know, is it generally gets picked up by antivirus, regardless of what type of encoding you use and stuff like that. And I used to do a bunch of different tricks. Like, I would grab a Metasploit payload, I'd UPX it, I'd obfuscate the UPX, so it would randomize it quite a bit. And then I would um, use um, Didier Stevens' technique of importing a Microsoft digital certificate into that executable and making it look like it was a Microsoft signed executable. And that got um, around for a long period of time, but then they started getting smart on that. And the latest version, I put in uh, Shellcode Exec. And is anybody familiar with Shellcode Exec? A couple people, it's good. Um, Shellcode Exec is a small executable, it's like 5K. And all it does is it takes an argument and you can inject alphanumeric shellcode straight into memory without ever having to touch disk. So it's just a small executable that, that cr basically uses write process memory to load a bunch of Alpha New York shell code straight into memory, and then it, it creates your interpreter shell. So that's also in here. But the coolest part now of the Java applet, and I want to show this to you, and I'll use the, the shell code exec as an example. <coughs> but with the newest version of set, it does something really unique. And there's a guy named Matthew uh, Graber who figured out a way to inject shell code straight into memory through PowerShell. And so I rewrote the Java applet to automatically detect when PowerShell is installed. And so as soon as they click run on the Java applet, it detects if PowerShell is there. It drops a completely custom um, PowerShell command onto the system that shoots Minterpreter straight into memory and never touches disk. So you don't have to worry about antivirus ever again, ever. Now what's cool about this is, regard is anybody familiar with PowerShell and execution restriction policies, right? So at DEF CON 16, the guy, uh, Josh Kelly and myself, we presented on how to bypass execution restriction policies. And all you do, and it's documented, it's, like not, it's not like a hack or anything, but what you do is you take um, your script, you make sure it's in one line, so it can't be multiple lines, it can't actually be you know, a big script. It's all in one line, you unicode it, you base64 encode it, and then you pass the encoded command parameter to PowerShell, 
And that allows you to essentially execute regardless of what type of execution restriction policy you have in place. So even if you're using the most restrictive execution restriction policy, it bypasses that and allows you to still execute whatever you want to on that machine. And I'll give you an example of that in here in a second. And just to show you what it looks like, what, what the Java Apple uh, attack does, <coughs> if you see a string right here, right up there, this is the encoded string of the PowerShell attack. And so what happens is the index.html of whatever website that you're trying to, trying to um, clone gets rewritten and adds parameters onto the index page. And then the Java app will go and pull those parameters so it's unique every time. And it's good from an obfuscation perspective too. And so it'll pull those parameters and then it'll actually run them if PowerShell is detected. And here's kind of what the code looks like a little bit as far as the PowerShell stuff goes from Matt. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is it right here. He's just um, you know, basically using the .NET uh, libraries as well as um, leveraging PowerShell to enumerate kernel32.dll and msvrt uh, crt.dll. And then he goes and pulls um, the shellcode parameters here. And there's two based off of 64-bit and 32-bit. He then you know, writes the page sizes to that and then injects that into memory and then creates a process for it. So it never touches disk. And I've changed this around so that it's one line versus many. So I'm going to go to the website. You can see here that it'll look and feel every way, shape, or form as Gmail, if it pops up. So make sure I got my IP right. Uh, that was just a, a stale process. It should, yeah, it should have killed the stale process. We should be good. That's the listener. Oh, sorry, it's 129, that's my address, that's why. I got it, thanks guys. All right, so we get Gmail that pops up. Now one thing I did that was kind of funny is, um, by the way, if you hit cancel, then they go to enter my username and password in, pops back up again. They can't even enter their credentials and they can't even close their browser. It's really effing annoying. And, um, and so that's the Java repeater. So they're going to click run no matter what. But to make it even more believable, about a year and a half ago when I came out with this attack, you could sign the publisher name with whatever you wanted to using self-signed uh, self uh, code signing certs, right? <coughs> and so after that got kind of popular and people were like, holy crap, you can sign it with like Microsoft and Google and it made it real believable. Java like, you know, got really ticked and basically did an update about six months ago that shows a big unknown in the publisher field. So what I did was I just went and registered an LLC in the state of Ohio called Verified Publisher. And then I bought a code signing certificate from GoDaddy. So, you know, the application's digital signature has been verified. Do you want to run the application? Yeah, sure, of course. And you notice it defaults to always trust content from this publisher. It's real trusting. So as soon as I hit run, and there's a lot of mathematical equations that's going on right now to calculate the shell code um, and the size of it, but you'll see here now I'm getting my payload all through PowerShell. You'll see here that I get my interpreter shell and it's migrating from process PowerShell to Notepad and now I have fully compromised the machine without ever having to touch disk through the Java applet. Bam. Now, the second attack I want to show you, and let me get my uh, handler up, is the Tinsy attack. And is anybody familiar with the Tinsies? Anybody not familiar with the Tinsy? Good. That's good. I'm not rehashing a bunch of old stuff. Let me just get this set up real quick. All right, so we're set up here. I type really slow. And um, what the Tinsy is, is this little computer chip here. There's two different models, the Tinsy++ Plus Plus and the Tinsy smaller size. It's this thing right here. You can buy them from prjc.com. And they're about, I don't know, 13 bucks or so. 
And what's unique about this is it's, it, it can emulate whatever you want to. It's just using our, the Adreno programming language. So it's got a small processor in here and onboard memory. And what's cool about it is it emulates a mouse and a keyboard. And so why it's important is it bypasses auto run. When you plug it in, it emulates a keyboard and has onboard storage. So think of the things that you can do with that. So you can do a downloader and stuff like that, which is kind of cool. Well, what we did is we, um, we, took a, we went to Best Buy and we bought like a $150 keyboard, bought two of them. And this keyboard is like the best keyboard you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it's got like iTunes hooking with it and a bunch of like really nice lights at back. And, you know, it's got neon lights and stuff. And we sent it to two of the guys in IT. And what we did is we modified it first. We opened up the keyboard. We started this in as an inline device. And so the keyboard goes through this first and then out to the actual signal sending. And what happens is every time it goes through here, it resets a counter on here, okay? So someone presses the, the letter D. D goes through here. It repeats the D back to it so it's a normal keyboard and it resets the counter. Well, what we did is, we, if we detected about five minutes of inactivity, it moved the mouse up one pixel and to the left, so the screensaver doesn't kick on, and you don't notice the, the mouse moving. And we waited about um, eight to nine hours of inactivity, so when they were at home or away from the, their keyboard, right? And what we found is, we can deploy payloads at that point and drop a, a binary onto the system through this guy, and fully compromise it without them ever knowing about it. Now, the funny part about it is we sent it to two IT guys. We ended up getting four shells back from four different people. So my guess is like the other two IT guys ganked it because they were jealous about the new keyboards, which is what we do in IT. We steal other people's stuff. And <laughs> so, they, you know, surprise on them. They should learn how to gank stuff. But let me show you a, a little bit of a demo of this. And this is using uh, the new version of SET has the um, PowerShell mechanism on it, so you can drop basically an interpreter straight into memory. Now, there's also another technique that I use, too, um, with shellcode exec, is I'll take shellcode exec, I'll convert it to hexadecimal, and then I'll write it to the operating system, and then I'll reconvert it back to a binary using PowerShell. So I just write a small PowerShell stub that reads in, raw, uh, reads in, binary and is, or reads in hex and writes out raw binary. It's really easy. And so it'll allow you to basically drop a binary into the system as much as you want to. And the problem with some of these Tinsies are it has... Um, it has storage capability or storage limitations. So you only have 64K of storage on it. So we soldered an SD card onto it. We wrote native SD drivers into it so that the Tinsy natively reads the SD card and doesn't mount it as an SD card storage device. So you can have as much room as you want to on the Tinsy device itself. <coughs> Another thing that we did too is instead of actually having to copy it over because writing on an entire binary, especially a large one, takes forever, we wrote a small stager that opens up a COM port and then transfer, transfer, reinitializes itself back as a as a COM adapter and then transfers it over via COM, so it, dro it drops it off in about two seconds. Now, here's this. You pop it in and watch the magic. Now, you can make this blackout. I, I'm working on the, the blackout code. I got it from Garland, one of my good buddies. And uh, this is just running the PowerShell command encoded. See, I'm not typing. I don't have a guy over there typing either with a wireless. And it's almost done. So it'll go ahead and execute. <coughs> so it executes. And that'll eventually go away. And over here, we get our interpreter shell without ever having to touch disk. Just from that guy. So in concluding with all of this, I have a lot more demos that I can show you, but uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately. There's a lot of cool stuff I want to show you fast track. Um, but needless to say, there's a lot of cool stuff out there that you can do. If you look at my presentation, what I'm trying to explain is it's not all bad. We have a lot of good things coming out of the industry. It's just we have a lot of work to do because we are such an immature industry. We have so much work to do in order to fix our, our companies and actually protect against them that it's going to require a major change in how we're currently doing things. It's going to cause a major change of who are in charge of things in order to actually meet the demands of what we're doing today in security. Does anybody have any questions? So how did you um, uh, address the issue of uh, security or just general quality from uh, like developers or uh, the, uh, the like uh, companies that you use to you know program stuff for you and uh, good question yeah so his question was how did you address the um, issues and concerns around things that you program either internally or you have outside entities uh, program for you as well, correct? Around application security. How can you raise, how did you raise the, the level? 
Yeah, so what we did is, um, for my company, we have development shops all over the place. So we have places in India, we have places um, in um, our Ohio facilities, we have places in um, Florida. And what we ended up doing is, we got injected, so you, if you look at who does the software development of a company, it usually funnels up to some VP, and then down to some multiple other people, and it kind of spreads out from there. And so we hit the VP up first, and what we did is we injected ourselves from the very early conceivement of the software development lifecycle. So as soon as a new application or new version or new something comes alive, we're involved from the very beginning of it. And then throughout the entire software development lifecycle, we're very much involved. And so if you look at the actual developers, um, we work very closely with them on a regular basis on ensuring that their code's quality. Now, in addition, they have to go through yearly mandatory education and awareness training, right? We did ours differently. We show our developers how to hack. And so they had, there's test environments where they can go and penetrate things. Um, we show them how to reverse code. We show them how, you know, how to actually leverage SQL injection and compromise things. That's our user awareness because we figured if we're just going to tell them about a bunch of boring security stuff, they're not going to really care. But if they can actually hack their own stuff, and we actually use our, li our, our old applications that suck to do it. Um, so you know, it, it, it's been kind of a, a two-fold approach to that. But then before it's ever released in production, we work with them. We have source code analysis and dynamic testing that we do uh, before it's ever released in any, any type of production. What we've seen is we rarely have um, any type of large exposure. It's usually minor things that they've missed. Um, so we've seen a significant reduction in taper off. It's an almost non-existence of SQL injection um, and cross-site scripting. You know, things that we start to run into a little bit here and there are more of permission a uh, attributes and, and things to that effect. So it's been pretty, pretty good and successful from that part. When it comes to actually outsourcing that code, we don't do it. We haven't moved to the model of outsourcing code development outside, and specifically because it's a risk to the organization. Uh, we find that if we move our code outside to somewhere in India or China or things like that, you should pretty much kiss that code goodbye because it's really just gone in your intellectual property and it's gone. And so it was a decision a while back not to do that. Uh, at least it was a decision between us and the VP that handles the development side of it. And so we've been pretty successful in um, at least application security and maturing our software development lifecycle to where it's pretty mature. Very good question. Any other questions? Well, thanks. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.